Hello and welcome to the Women's Health Theme. Today we're going to be talking about menstrual disorders. So before we start, we're just going to have a few questions to assess your existing knowledge. So, question one. Which is an example of a menstrual disorder? Is it A, polycystic ovarian syndrome, B, premature ovarian failure, C, menorrhagia, or D, endometriosis? So, some of them are causes and one of them is an actual menstrual disorder. The answer is C, menorrhagia. Question two. What is amenorrhea? Is it A, painful periods, B, lack of periods, C, infrequent periods, or D, heavy periods? So, menorrhea refers to the flow of blood at menstruation. And the answer is B, lack of periods. In question three, which is an example of a premenstrual symptom? A, abdominal pain, B, vaginal discharge, C, bloating, or D, emotional lability? So, premenstrual syndrome is often banded about when talking about periods, but it actually refers to a set of symptoms that occur before the onset of the menses. And the answer is D, emotional ability, and it's very common. So, menstrual disorders. Today we're going to talk about primary versus secondary amenorrhea, what is just menorrhea, oligomenorrhea versus menorrhagia, and then premenstrual syndrome and a few OSCE slash history taking tips. And then some questions to test your understanding at the end. So menstrual disorders is just an umbrella term used to describe abnormal conditions that occur within a woman's menstrual cycle. And these include these conditions listed here that we're going to talk about today. So to start with, we're going to talk about amenorrhea. So amenorrhea can be split into primary and secondary amenorrhea. So primary amenorrhea is failure of the menses to occur either age 16 or two years after the onset of puberty, or age 14 in girls who have not undergone puberty. Um, so some symptoms of key features of puberty are growth spurt, development of secondary sexual characteristics such as breast development and pubic hair growth. So if by age 13 menses hasn't occurred and there's no onset of puberty, a workup of primary amenorrhea should begin. So some causes of, of primary amenorrhea, sometimes referred to as ovulatory amenorrhea, include Chromosomal or genetic abnormalities, such as Turner syndrome, where there is a partially or completely missing X chromosome, so there are high levels of testosterone. Kalman syndrome, where there is low FSH and LH levels. Obstructive abnormalities. Problems with the thyroid or hypothalamus or pituitary gland, such as eating disorders, excessive exercise or extreme stress. Okay, so moving on to secondary amenorrhea. Secondary amenorrhea is cessation of the menses after they've begun. So if they've been absent for three, more than three months or more than three cycles, then it's classed as secondary amenorrhea because a menstrual cycle lasting more than 90 days is abnormal. So there's disruption in the gonadotropin-stimulated estrogen production, which causes um, the menses to stop. So common causes. So there is natural causes, such as pregnancy, breastfeeding, and the menopause. Medications can cause it, so the contraception, so progesterone-only pill, an intrauterine device and the injection all can stop your periods. Antidepressants can also stop your periods because they increase the level of progesterone. And chemotherapy can destroy the cells which produce the oestrogen. So there's gynecological causes as well, so polycystic ovarian syndrome where there are high levels of androgen. Or premature ovarian failure where the ovaries stop functioning. So also can be thyroid problems or caused by pituitary tumours. Okay, so diagnosis of amenorrhea. Um, so you need to take a good history, um, including a very detailed men uh, menstrual history, including how old they were when the period started, how long they last for, when their last period was, etc. etc. Um, you need to do a review of systems because it's very important, for example, if there's a pituitary tumour, and they might also have visual changes, headaches, change in smell, things like that. Um, physical examination. And they need to measure FSH, LH, testosterone, prolactin and karyotype the patient. It's important to karyotype the patient because if there's a Y chromosome present, then a bilateral oophrectomy is recommended because of the risk of ovarian germ cell cancer. Um, so to treat it, you need to treat the underlying disorder. You need to treat the symptoms and the long-term effects of estrogen deficiency and you need to minimise the risk of um, androgen excess. 
So moving on from amenorrhea to dysmenorrhea. Dysmenorrhea is pain, uterine pain around the time of the menses that can occur with the menses or precede it. The pain is usually described as sharp, but it can be cramping, throbbing, dull, constant ache, and it can radiate to the legs. Um, and it tends to peak 24 hours after the onset of the menses and go away, menses or go away after two days. So other symptoms include um, headache, nausea, constipation, diarrhea. Um, and it can be split into primary and secondary dysmenorrhea. So primary dysmenorrhea cannot be explained by structural gynecological disorders, whereas secondary symptoms are due to this. So endometriosis causes increased pain in periods. Um, so evaluation of this, so you need a good history and examination. And you, a pelvic ultrasonography can look for things such as endometriosis, pelvic masses, um, any fibroids, etc. So treat, you need to treat the underlying disorder. Okay. So moving on now to oligomenorrhea. This is where there are a condition where there is infrequent menstrual periods. So women go regularly more than 35 days without menstruating and it occurs more than 90 days after 90 days without a period. So causes. So it can be a side effect of hormonal birth control because it's, this is the most common cause of oligomenorrhea and um, because women experience lighter and lighter periods um, after starting hormonal birth control on the periods can cause it can cause the period to stop completely. They engage in sports, they have eating disorders, they have diabetes or thyroid problems, or high levels of prolactin. It's very common in adolescent girls and perimenopausal women because of the changes in hormone levels. So for so evaluation, you need, it's usually diagnosed as part of a menstrual history. And it's not a serious condition on its own. But um, if you want to treat it, you can treat it by adding in hormonal contraception, for example, that will regulate hormone levels. Okay, so moving on now to menorrhagia. Menorrhagia is excessive menstrual blood loss that occurs regularly. And it is defined as a loss of blood, a loss of more than 80 milliliters or a period lasting more than seven days. So most women during their periods lose between 30 and 40 milliliters of blood. Um, or it can also be defined as the need to change menstrual products such as a tampon or a pad for one every one to two hours. So it can occur alone or it can occur with other symptoms. It's often caught, associated with a lot of pain. So causes, so 50% of menorrhagia has no known cause. Um, uterine and ovarian pathologies such as uterine fibroids, endometriosis, um, adenomyosis, polycystic ovarian syndrome can all cause menorrhagia. Um, systemic disorders such as coagulation disorders, hypothyroidism, diabetes. Uh, it can be arachnogenic, so anticoagulant, chemotherapy, intrauterine device can all cause menorrhagia. Um, and it affects quality of life, can cause someone to become anemic. So diagnose it, history and examination. Um, blood tests to rule out um, anemia, check they're not anemic, and also see if there's any underlying cause for the menorrhagia that we can treat such as um, thyroid function and we refer to gynecology if the first sign treatments do not work so the first sign treatments are the intrauterine system so the marina coil or the combined oral contraceptive in combination with non-steroidal anti-inflammatories okay so moving on now to our last disorder that we're going to talk about today this is premenstrual syndrome which is characterized by these symptoms um, and they often occur a week before the onset of the menses. The cause is not really known, and they can become more varied between different women and different cycles of the same woman. They can be increased by stress or before you undergo the menopause. Um, so common symptoms include irritability, anxiety, anger, agitation, insomnia, difficulty concentrating, and fatigue. So it's diagnosed based on physical symptoms. But there is also a, um, so it's quite common, 20 to 50% of women of reproductive age have this disorder, but there is also another disorder called premenstrual dysorphic disorder that 5% of women suffer from, and it can lead to an increase in suicidal thoughts, suicidal tendencies. So this is diagnosed by symptoms. So women must have these five or more of the symptoms described above for most of the week before the menses, and they must have had those, those symptoms for 12 months to get, a disorder, to get a diagnosis of PMDD. So to treat it, so symptomatic relief, um, do all those things that people tell you to do to 
prove your period pain, such as exercise, um, NSAIDs to relieve the pain and dysmenorrhea, and SSRIs to relieve the anxiety and depression that's often associated with premenstrual syndrome. Okay, so moving on now to OSCE tips. These are just a few tips that I came up with whilst on placement and thought it was important for OSCE scenarios because obviously a really important thing for Obstangani is a really important, really detailed history. So use Socrates to explore the pain, especially in dysmenorrhea. Um, menstrual history, so you need to talk about the duration of their usual period, um, how often they occur, are they every 28 days, every 35 days, how much blood do they have, so how often do they have to change their um, menstrual devices, um, when was the last period, how old were they when they started their periods, do they have any other symptoms, are they on any contraception, have they used any past, what's worked for them, or are they trying to get pregnant. Is there any abnormal bleeding, so are they bleeding after sex, are they bleeding between periods, or if they're if they've gone through the menopause, have they had any postmenopausal bleeding? Is there any vaginal discharge? Are they having pain during sex? And it's important to differentiate if this is superficial or deep pain during sex. Are there any other relevant symptoms such as bowel, urinary, fever, malaise, unintentional weight loss? Trying to rule out those red flag symptoms. Is there any gynecological past history? Are they up to date with their smears? And is there a family history? of any menstrual disorders or any gynecological disorders in the family. An obstetric history, because we need to know if they've had any children, how many pregnancies have they had, have any miscarriages, any stillbirths, any terminations. So they are really important for your obs and granny history, these pointers. So in summary, I'm going to stop talking now. I'm um, just going to ask you a couple more questions to see if you've understood and then, yeah. So question one. When should amenorrhea be investigated? A, failure of the menses before the age of 13 with no puberty. B, failure of the menses before the age of 14 with puberty. C, failure of the menses for two consecutive cycles. Or D, failure of the menses after 16 years of age. So these are quite wordy definitions, so just think carefully. And the answer is A, failure of the menses before the age of 13 with no puberty. Question two. What is Secondary dysmenorrhea. A. Dysmenorrhea caused by structural gynecological abnormalities. B. Dysmenorrhea with no known cause. C. Dysmenorrhea that is constant throughout the cycle. D. Dysmenorrhea not caused by structural gynecological abnormalities. So, dysmenorrhea is pain around the time of the menses, if you've forgotten that. The answer is D. Dysmenorrhea caused by structural gynecological abnormalities. So, primary has no known cause, secondary has a cause. And finally, question three. What is the first line treatment for menorrhagia? Is it A, combined oral contraceptive, B, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, C, the intrauterine device, i.e. the marina coil, or D, tranexamic acid? All of these can be started by the GP and you must start these by the GP. You must start the first line treatment by the GP before you refer on to gynecology for menorrhagia. The answer is C, the intrauterine system, i.e. the marina coil. So, that's all I've got to talk about today. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you've learned something. Thank you.